I'm thinking of Donald Rumsfeld. I'm Dave. I like the microphone. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about your anything. Hi, Dave. We're starting a little late, but there's nothing but lunch after me, so. Dark tangent. Nothing. Like yeah, yeah, so if you want to go see Jeff over lunch, I won't be a fan. Why should you care about anything that I'm about to say? One, you're here, so good on you. Two, I've been pen testing since about 96. Uh, I stopped offering pen testing as a commercial service in 2003 because, frankly, most people who bought pen tests didn't care about them and didn't want them. So I only do that for people that actually I know that I like, that I actually want to do work for now. Um, the rest of my time I actually do forensics. Uh, I find that people actually care about the results. Uh, I'm the captain of the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition's Red Team since 2007. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the CCDC circuit, it is fun for us. <laughs> and uh, I'd be happy to tell you more about it. Uh, I think I'm an all-around good guy. I wrote a couple books. Uh, the Hacking Exposed Computer Forensic Series, that's me, and uh, part of the Anti-Hacker Toolkit. And I'm an extra witness. I testify about this stuff. So, what is CCDC versus a CTF and a standard pen test? Uh, CCDC is an event that is made to teach college kids how to defend their networks. It's a little different than most things. They don't get to attack back. So we have the fun of all the aggression without having to worry about anything coming back at us, which leads to a whole lot more fun and time to think about how to do really sneaky things. Now, if you're in a CTF team or you're running a pen test team at your office, there's still a lot of lessons that we've come to learn that you can take with you. So that's why I think it's, it's a valid talk for everyone. I like to think we kind of have a, a dream team forming on our red team. Uh, we've had Nickerson with us the whole time, Ryan Jones with us the whole time, uh, Raphael Mudge just joined our team, uh, Val Smith has been with us for a couple of years, uh, you might re recognize Rubix, came on and joined us uh, last year, uh, Jeff Scapara from the military side, and uh, my boy Evan uh, who works at Dish Networks, he can make sure you can't get free TV. <laughs> If you are interested in joining my dream team, we are have three spots open this year for invited members. So if you think you're a bad dude, email me. The first year I became involved, when we got started, it was amazing. <laughs> Everything was burning. Every no student was prepared. Before the prior team, they were okay, but they were not coordinated. They didn't talk and basically they did decom. And the kids, they responded to DCOM, and when DCOM went away, you know, most of the guys left the room. The red teamers got bored, and everybody else kind of stuck around trying to find what they could do. But the difference between our competition and others is it's a three-day event. And the kids have to defend the same network all three days. So if on day one, this happens, on day two, most of the fires are out, and all the doors are closed. Year two, we didn't understand why everything wasn't burning still. The kids started saying, hey, we came back. That's what they did to us last year. Let's pull the plug so on day one, they can't mess with us as much. We'll just start patching everything real quick. And that worked pretty well. We were kind of sad. <laughs> on year three, we got better. We started thinking to ourselves, what can we do to actually make this work? What can we do to make day three as much fun as day one? And we re what we realized, because the kids, and now some come back for three years, and we have you know, seniors, they're allowed to compete for you know, all the years for undergrad, and then they're allowed to have one grad student on their team, and he can stick around for a while because grad students stick a while. They don't have to graduate so much. <laughs> Is that we had to get smarter. We had to start coordinating as a team. And doing that involved forcing communication. Doing that involved making sure that people actually talked to each other in the room. And we had a pretty small red team when we started. Uh, we had maybe seven guys, and you know, we're talking seven teams. So we had like one person for a team of six people they're going after. So we're, we're outnumbered as far as the number of hands on keyboards. So we have to react quickly. And these kids are sitting there in front of the systems we're attacking. And that's their job, is waiting to, for us to come in. So we not only have to, we have to be sneaky, but we have to be smart about how we stay in. So at this point, we started using wikis just for our red team to start sharing information and forcing it. And the next year, next year I enforced it. I started actually getting in front of the room and checking it 
and yelling at people and saying, what are you doing? Why aren't you sharing? What are you doing? What are you using? What do you know? What do you actually know how to do? Why are you here? Because half of our seats in our competition are guys that we get to ask to come and play, like Nickerson and Mubix and all the rest of the guys. But the other half are people whose companies have sponsored the competition with enough cash where they get a seat with us. Sometimes those guys are awesome. Other times, not so much. <laughs> and so the important thing to do is to get people to be honest with you. When you look at someone, you say, what can you do? And they come back, well, I, I lead the red team for such and such company. You say, that's, that's great. But what can you do? What, what tools do you actually run? You know, Because everyone's willing to admit to a tool usage. People are very uncomfortable telling you about their skill set. No one wants to admit what they can and can't do to a group of people that they think are a bunch of egotistical assholes. <laughs> and while that may be true, when they're in the room with me, they only get to be assholes. The ego part drops. Because we enforce discipline. We say, everyone who's here, do you have the Batrack CD now? And everyone with DVD now. And everybody goes, yes, yes, we do. Okay. We're all going to use that as a standard baseline for our tools. If you don't have Batrack, raise your hand now. And let's start matching people up who have skills, they complement each other. And if you have no skills, that's okay. We'll put a really strong guy with you. And then your job is going to be writing down what the fuck you did. <laughs> <laughs> this is also when we started looking at, you know, using core is great. Using Metasploit is great. But none of those things let people work with each other. Uh, and that's when people started coming back to me and telling about Raphael Mudge's tool, Armitage. And they're like, wow, that sounds really neat. I'm like, Armitage is really neat, but it misses a couple of things that we need for our special type of a group, an event, which he's now fixed for us because you got him involved. Um, we come from a range of IP addresses that we're allowed to be confined to, you know, random subnets, and the students are allowed to block us at will. So if you said, let's have all of our attacks kind of have one IP address, I would tell you that's a horrible idea because everything will die very quickly because there's these kids that are sitting there watching with firewall logs and anything that looks even strangely out of the ordinary, they block. So you have to be really fast. And then last year. Last year we're like, you know what? All these tools are great. But they're not meant to be quiet. They're not meant to be stealthy. And they don't actually leave real back doors. Like Metasploit. Metasploit's a great tool. Metasploit will get you in. Metasploit will help you out. It's your buddy. But if you want to be quiet, and you actually want to hide your process, Metasploit has, you can migrate to Notepad or another process, but it has no ability to hide a process. It has no ability to actually provide any of the functionality you need to actually inject into a function to hide the presence of a file, the presence of memory, the presence of a login user. None of these things exist. I mean, it is not a rootkit. And of course, it was designed not to be a rootkit, but we needed rootkits. And the problem was we needed rootkits that weren't already known. Because if it was a known rootkit, everybody runs antivirus. Everybody runs anti-spyware, anti-malware. If you use one, it gets popped every time. It's top and stop, pop and stop. So we had to start writing our own custom backdoors, our own custom malware, basically. And it worked really good. <laughs> because the kids didn't know what to do. So for instance, one of the, this year specifically, we did something really sneaky. Uh, how many of you have heard of Joomla? It's pretty popular. We rewrote the core framework, PHP, to actually turn it into a backdoor. <laughs> so if you actually put in a encoded request to a variable that actually didn't exist, it would parse it, execute it, and return the result. None of them thought to actually check individual framework files inside their PHP code. That backdoor stayed pretty much every team for the entire competition. This year, this year was a good year. This year, a lot of the guys actually had the time to think if our little stupid backdoors worked. What if we made big backdoors that worked? And we started doing massive, not only callback backdoors and rootkits that actually would sit there and persist and recreate themselves every time they got installed. But Mubix, Mubix made my favorite new one, new piece of malware, that within the weekend that we deployed it for our little competition where it's not supposed to leave, already got reported and identified by Microsoft as no malware. <laughs> it would uninstall patches. <laughs> Every time they patched, it would silently uninstall the patch. 
and it was our way of getting back in. It didn't do anything else. It wasn't a back door as far as, I'm going to make sure you can connect in. It was a silent way of making sure we could keep getting back in. It was awesome. <laughs> By the end of the day three of that competition, we had five different back doors and three different pieces of custom malware loaded across all their systems, the ones we still had access to, some got smart, that we could actually start having a lot of fun. And so we could actually burn a system. Um, my favorite way to burn a system is not to wipe it and it's not to delete certain parts of it. I only overwrite the MBR. And sometimes I do custom MBRs. So we have one that says, please return this computer to Best Buy. <laughs> and then one of the students actually gave us a great one. It's an ASCII NANCAT MBR. And so the machine reboots, and there's NANCAT running across the screen. Which is, it has its pros and cons. So the first year that we wiped someone's MBR, it was a Solaris system, and we rebooted it. And they all thought it was hardware failure. And so they were down for like an hour complaining how they had this bad piece of hardware. And so the white team, who were the helpful guys, came to us afterwards, and they're like, what did you guys do? You're not supposed to write white EEPROMs, right? You know that's off, off limits. We're like, yeah, we didn't do that. I'm like, has anyone looked at the disk? They're like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> so they went back to the team and they're like, no, they, they, your heart was fine, dude. And they finally reinstalled. But what was already happening by this point in year three is they are all making backups of their systems. And because we're quiet on day one, if they're not a returning team who don't know our tricks, they think that they're safe. So they make backups of all of our infected systems, and every time that they think that we got them, they restore our un their, excuse me, they, they restore the backups with our back doors again. So we could actually start burning systems with immunity. Every time they would take it, we take it down, they bring it back up, we get it back in. We could actually take down a system, wait 30 minutes, and get a call back from our shell again. It was magic. By the end of the third day, we still had 30 sessions after taking down systems like five or six times. Oh, it was a good day. <laughs> and the best part was, a lot of the callbacks, we weren't even that good at them yet as far as actually creating good, fake, stupid domains and things that look legitimate. It was going to like infowarrior.com or <laughs> netstars, you know, stupid stuff that they should be like, there's no, 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 nothing, nothing legitimate should go here. <laughs> But they're still learning, and our goal is to keep making it harder on them, because, and what I want to talk about in the next couple slides, is your goal at a red team isn't just to fuck someone over. It may happen, sure, and it's fun when it does happen. But if the person who you're messing with does not learn what you did and how to defend against it, it was a pointless exercise. It was an exercise for you to have fun and for them to feel pain, and no one comes back for more pain. Unless you explain to them how you did it and how they can fend against it, and that you have to be smarter next year about what you're going to do to them to make it harder. It's only a one-sided exchange. And that, you know, unless you're from China and a Chinese employee, that's not cool. If you are from China. Communication is vital. Make your red teamers talk to each other. If you have a guy in the quarter who's awesome, but he doesn't talk to anyone, He's only good against the people he's going against, and he's not helping the rest of the team be more effective. If you have more than one target, in other words, if you're on a competition team, a CTF team, multiple organizational units that you're going after, he's not helping the rest of the organization feel that same amount of pain. So they're getting off light. They're not actually having all the vulnerabilities exposed. And that guy doesn't have time to go across everything. That's why you split it up in the first place. Force communication force people using wikis, force them to share information about services, known exploits, known tools, what tools are working. By the end of day two on our wiki, we actually have full write-ups of this is how you do this incredibly sneaky thing that I just figured out. So that everyone can do that incredibly sneaky thing and every team can feel that pain. Two, standardization of tools. Now I'm not saying you shouldn't be able to run any tool that you want, but everyone should have the same base toolkit. Everyone should be able to say, hey, what did you use? Oh, well, you start with this, and then you go use this module. Oh, and then go get this other thing that I use for the final step. But if everyone can't start from that same base level of understanding this is the tool, this is the module, or this is the tool, this is the scan, type of scan that I did that brought it back, you can't help each other because you're going to be talking two different languages. So standardize your tools. Three, if you plan to use backdoors and rootkits as part of your pen test, if that's allowed, you're going to have to do custom development. Or at least you're going to have to tweak the ones that have been released enough so that it no longer matches a known signature. Everybody runs antivirus. And it's sad. 
<laughs> D, your job as a red team member is to help your fellow members and to teach the blue teams a lesson. If you're not teaching them a lesson, you're not doing your job as a red team member. E, the first 30 minutes of competition will determine your success or failure. This is especially true for us. In our competition, the red team and the blue teams enter the rooms at the same time. We start when they start. Within the first 30 minutes, they're patching their systems, we're attacking their systems. Most of the patching systems out there are pretty fast and pretty good. You can get a system up and at least initially secure, not counting you know, application vulnerabilities or anything like that, but actual operating system level vulnerabilities. Within 30 minutes, you should be able to get everything. You should be able to capture and patch everything that's known. So in that first 30 minutes, if you're in a competition red team, you're not in as many systems as possible. If you haven't initiated a framework that lets you do that and attack as many systems and deploy automatically as many methods as possible to retain your access, day two is not going to be as much fun. That afternoon is not going to be as much fun. Because it's important that you get in and you stay in. Establish goals. Don't make your red team a series of star players. Make your red team a team, and you're all going for something together. Have them want to help each other to achieve that goal. In our competition, we have a scoreboard, and the scoreboard says these are services that are up and down based upon each team. Red means down, green means up. So we encourage each other to have an all red board. That's what we want, every system down, every service down. Being able to work together to say, hey guys, this guy, I, I noticed this team seems to be up and they, they won't go down, you know, who's assigned to them? Guy raises his hand, they work together because everybody wants that to happen. Everybody wants that share to go. Everybody wants as much pain to be inflicted as possible. Don't make it about individual points. I've heard some people talk about in other competitions, oh yeah, this guy won the red team. Or, yeah, this guy claimed this many accesses. That doesn't help you as a team. Because what's going to happen is that guy who's winning, he's going to be like, man, this is awesome. I'm like the most badass guy on the red team. Why is he going to help everyone else be as badass as he is if he's going to win something for it or if he's going to be recognized for it? Being on the red team and having the camaraderie of being able to do these things together and laughing and high-fiving each other when you know that they're sitting there going, what the, f how did, why is there Nankin on my screen? <laughs> that is that shared joy is something that should be enough to kind of keep the team motivated together. If you make it about individual stars, they won't help the other ones because they want to retain that status. And that's the part of the egotistical asshole I'm talking about. You gotta drop the ego. You have to enforce that. Which goes to point C, shared success. It's not just about, man, you were awesome. I can't believe you did that. It's like, man, we were awesome. We all worked together. And I know it sounds kind of funny, you know, if you, especially if you've been on some of the CTF teams in the past, to say that. But if you can get a recurring team, in other words, if you can get the same guys to come back together each time, or in your company, if you have your company working together, the same pen test team, hopefully you have a core group. Enforcing that really makes everyone feel like a lot, they feel a lot closer, they want to share a lot more. But finally, the most important thing is getting your red teamers talking. No matter how junior, no matter what a superstar they are, Get them to talk to each other about, hey, what are you using for this? How can I use that? How can I take advantage of that? Have you thought about this? Making sure that people are equal in terms of being able to speak brings up new ideas. Always try to balance your team. And this is true no matter what type of pen testing you're doing. Make sure that the weakest guys are paired with the strongest guys. The strongest guys may say, I don't want to have this guy with me and explain to him, hey, his job is to make your life easier because he's going to write down what you're doing. Who doesn't want that? Who doesn't want to just play and never have to write down what they're doing? That's awesome. One of the best things about red teaming in a competition team, no real life penalties, no worry about liability, and no report writing. It's just fun. Who doesn't want to do that? It's all the things the bad guys get to do, and we get to finally do it. So, pair up. Let them share experience, let them share, offload the burden, and make everyone stronger. And make sure that all the teams you're going against, the organizational units you're going against, experience the same level of proficiency. One person shouldn't come off doing better or looking better in a report because they had a weaker team member against them. That doesn't help that person. Now, 
we have different approaches, um, and other people have different approaches, how they build teams. Our teams are built so that we actually have two people per team we're going against. That works for some people, that doesn't work for others. It works for me because I don't need to have strong and weak. Again, I have sponsor seats and I have invited seats. So I can never guarantee I don't have everybody in the room be awesome, up to a certain level. Other approaches that I've been told before, and this is apparently more of a military method, is what they do is they split off people into teams. So you have, I'm the team that does nothing but scan for new services. And that's what those guys will do the entire competition, scan for new services. You have a second team. I'm the team that goes through and exploits systems as we find them. And that's all I do. I exploit systems and I hand it over. And then you have a third team. We're the team that goes in after exploitation and we gather data and we expand access. They're both valid approaches. There's nothing wrong with either method. The question is which one fits better for your competition or for your red team style or your pen test or your company. How large of a group are you assessing? In our competition, we have 10 teams. I can't have three guys scan 10 teams all day long. They'll miss stuff. That's too few people for too many teams. So I have to split up resources. What works for you, I don't know. Dealing with troublemakers, you will have them. People who come onto your team, because I only get to say about some of my guys, and of course, no one wants to be kicked out because that's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but have zero tolerance. If someone's acting like an ass, and they're disrupting other people's ability to concentrate or be able to actually get done, stop them. Walk up to them and go, hey, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You understand, you're in a room with people who are trying to get something done, and you're over here dosing our own network, has happened. You're attacking our own printer, has happened. <laughs> you're reporting vulnerabilities against your teammates, has happened. <laughs> stop. Stop what you're doing. It's not cool. No one thinks it's funny. or you should maybe reconsider what you think your skills are and go help someone document. If you don't start that at the beginning, they'll keep making trouble because they're going to be upset or confused about why it is they don't feel like they're getting very far. Frustration can breed a lot of bad behavior in a red team room. If someone's going actively against the plan, for instance, when I run my team, we have a three-day plan. It was a two-day plan this year because they shut us down in two days. Day one, get in, be sneaky, do not reveal yourselves. Day two, unleash the dragon. I've had people on day one say, man, I'm bored. All I'm doing is sitting here watching these guys type. And I say, that's great. You have a frustration. Explain to me how you would do it better. Let's talk. If you validate their concerns about the plan, they will feel better about having some input and won't bitch as much and they won't do stupid things like sit on a box they had access to for six hours and not understand they're supposed to be doing something else. Has happened. If someone is unwilling to fulfill the requirements of a red team, in other words, if they don't want to follow the rules of the competition itself, just say, look, I'm sorry this isn't right for you. There are other people who want to play. I mean, who in this room would not like to spend a weekend doing nothing but breaking into college kids' computers, making them sad, <laughs> and never having to write a report? Show of hands. I think, I think it's, it's hilarious. It's fun. So if someone isn't willing to follow the rules, explain to them, you know, you're here and it's great, but there are other people who want to be here as badly as you do. So help us or get out of the way. Documenting what you did is just as important as what you did. This is true for our competition, may not be true for others. Team members only lose points, the blue teams that is, if we write down that we got in. No one does forensics after the fact to find all the vulnerabilities we exploited. So unless we just say, and it's not even a long report for us, we have to say, we got in, we have this level of access, and we did this. That's it. Not a lot of work. And when you've teamed up, someone else can do it for you if they're not very experienced. But if you didn't do that, if you never bothered taking the time to report that, they'll never lose the points and you did it for nothing. Well, you did it for fun, but it never impacted the people you're doing it against. And that's not as much fun. Our goal as a team, we want to, on the last hour of the competition, still retain access to every machine and wipe them all out. We want the last hour to be intense panic. All red, the all red board. Now we've done it, we've had one team wiped out all at once already. That was actually a Val Smith accomplishment. He was really, really good that year. 
Um, and then we've had all the services knocked out. So we've kind of had different lines across the board, mainly with diagonals, zigzags, but never in all red, all services down. That's our goal. That's what we're working towards as a red team. You have to decide what's realistic for you and your team uh, moving forward and set those goals. So now we have a sense of achievement and accomplishment. Everybody's working towards something. Everybody's working to build kits to do something. Because you're going to have to do custom development. You're going to have to create your own tools if you want to succeed long term. Because everyone else, all the kids and our teams have the exact same scanners we do. They all have the exact same access to public exploits we do. No one's going to drop a zero day on a competition. Maybe a black hat in DEF CON. So you just DEF CON, a black hat is MCTF. Um, because those guys are crazy. But our network's recorded and used for research. So if you drop zero day, it's going to be released at that point. So it's all publicly available exploits, and then you're using dismissed configurations and applications and backdoors you planned. So be smart. Make it work for you. And develop things that you know that they can't see. One of the backdoors we used two years ago, we were using STC, no, excuse me, STCP. STCP was awesome because it's the same protocol. It routes, but it's encrypted. And at the time, NetStat didn't show it. It was an auto rootkit. The protocol itself hid the traffic. Unless they sniffed the network, they would never see. And if they did, all they would see is encrypted TCP traffic. Since then, it's been patched. It's been added. So my name's Dave. That's my Twitter. That's my incredibly long blog name, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> um, forensics is my day-to-day -day job. If you get breached, let me know. Help you out. Um, questions, concerns. Uh, if you're running a regional CCDC, you're doing other types of competitions, you have questions, you want to know what tools you're using, let me know. I'll, I'm glad to help you out. I want more people to bring real world scenarios to people learning how to defend. If we don't do that, they'll never be able to defend successfully. <laughs>